Good evening to everyone present here with us today. This is Shreyan from IGCP, today's moderator. I would like to welcome all the viewers who have joined our platform for better exchange of knowledge that is going to be shared by our keynote speaker doctor for today's session. With much pleasure and honor, I would like to welcome a very renowned professor doctor D.G. Saple. Sir is MBBS, MD, FCPS, DDV, Fellow of Johns Hopkins University, Boomberg, USA. Professor and HOD of Dermatology at Grant Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospital, Mumbai. With the help of Sir and his wonderful insight, we will be taking a close look on today's topic, which is Skin Changes in Diabetes, Thyroid Disease and Crushing Syndrome. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome Sir at our forum and would like to hand over the session to him. Over to you, Sir. Hey, thank you, Sriyan. And I must thank IGCP and all those people are going to attend. Thank you very much in anticipation. And I hope my talk will be useful in your day-to-day -day practice and managing patients. So today's topic is already you are aware, that is skin manifestation of diabetes mellitus hypothyroidism and Cushing syndrome. So we are talking about these three conditions. First, we are going to talk about the diabetes because all of us, we, we know that uh, almost every sixth adult in our country has been affected by diabetes. So total about 77 million people, individuals are affected in our country. And if you do not work on prevention of this disease, it is expected 134 million people will be affected. So it will become, of course, the hub or what is called the capital of the diabetes in the, of the world. Then talking about this percentage-wise, the urban areas and the rural area, Urban area almost 16%, rural area is almost 9%. And this is because of the lifestyle. You know that lifestyle of the urban and the rural. Rural is a more peaceful, slow life. Urban is very stressful and very fast life. So that has made the difference. Then among the uh, diabetic patients, the, disorder, the skin disorders, almost you find 80% of the patients, they suffer from skin disorders. And out of 80, almost 50%, they get cutaneous infection and then other skin problems. So what are these cutaneous infections which you are seeing in day-to-day -day life in our practice or in our clinical OPD? Either it's a candida infection or the fungal infection or the bacterial infection. These are the three common infections we see. So what are the reasons? The reasons, one is, of course, compromised immune system. Second is compromised vascular system. And third is a peripheral neuropathy. So these are the three main causes in the diabetic patient. They develop skin or the cutaneous manifestation. Of course, that is because of chronic hyperglycemia. And that is called HB1AC. Now it's considered as one of the important investigations with the diabetes under control or not. So we have to control hyperglycemia to prevent all this 80% of the skin manifestation. Another reason, of course, is impairment of cytokine productions who are responsible for the inflammation and get rid of the infection. Leuco leukocyte recruitment innovation and neutrophil dysfunction, the neutrophils degranulation impairment, which is required for the control of any, any foreign organism in our body. So these are the various reasons why diabetic, diabetics patients they suffer from skin disease. In addition to that, dysfunction of the macrophages, which are scavenger cells, and the, what is called serving cells are natural killer cells and inhibition of the antibody. So these are the various reasons or the basic reasons 
where skin manifestations are very common is a diagrammatic representation. So what are this fungal infection? Fungal, either they are candida infection or dermatophytes. Candida usually get, wherever there the candida is saprophytes in the body, there is oral cavity, genital cavity in the female vaginal, in, a, in a male in the balanitis, in is and nail. These are the, uh, and dermatophytosis, they are according to the site. When it affects the body, it called tinea corporis. When it affects the flexural, it's called tinea cruris. When it affects the face, it's called tinea facei, tinea unguam, and tinea capitis. These are the various infections are seen. So is the type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes? When the poor glycemic control, the patient, they develop candida infection, which is saprophytic, which is usually we call a common cells. These common cells are present in our mucous membrane. They are non-pathognomic, but when our immunity gets suppressed or suppressed, they become pathognomic. So this candida albicans, there are various species, sorry, candida, there are various species, candida albicans, candida glabrata, there are the variety or cruzi. These are the various varieties. So uh, when this candida patient, they come to our clinic, either they come with the pseudomembranous, then you can see this membranous layer. This is how the candida patients clinically present to our clinic. Sometimes they get a curl-like things. You can see the curl-like thing, the white is maceration. And sometimes there comes only just redness or what we call the erythema. So these are the three variety of the candida infections are seen in the patients with the oral candidiasis. Of course, most of the time the common cause is the albicans, but in 20% it can be glabrata. Candida glabrata and the candida both usually they, they respond very well to fluconazole. Fluconazole is effective against this. This is as showing in the patients with malignancy or the AIDS. I'm being a HIV clinician for the last 30 years. We see this manifestations very common. This is usually seen, this type of candidiasis is seen in HIV patient or advanced HIV patient. Sometimes they come with the coating on the tongue and they lose their test. They said we have lost the test. And similar lesion sometimes they comes on the side of the tongue. But this is not candida. This is called a hairy leukoplakia. So it's, it's very important to differentiate from the candida from hairy leukoplakia. Ask patient to rub it. When they rub it, candida, it comes out. While hairy leukoplakia, you cannot rub it. That's how you differentiate. And that's how we have to diagnose uh, this hairy leukoplakia from the oral candidiasis. Now that was oral candidiasis. Similarly, you can get vulvovaginitis. Vulvovaginitis patient, they come to your clinic. They come with this erythema, redness. And what is important is satellite lesion, small, small. You can see the papules erythematic. These are the hallmark of candida infection. But sometimes they come with a curdy discharge. You can see this curdy discharge, like a curd like discharge. And when it becomes chronic, they come with the erythema, lichenification, and scratching or the itching. But it becomes chronically ill. The chronic disease, they, it, it, do not, they do not bother. They become really with the lichenification, they come with the lichenification and satellite lesions. Again, these satellite lesions I'm mentioning, but they are diagnostic of candida infection. So this is how the volovaginitis they present. They, but you know the differential like, like oral candidiasis, OHL, oral hairy leukoplakia is a differential diagnosis. Like that, trichomonas vaginitis is another differential diagnosis. But if you see this trichomonas vagina, I see, the, you get a discharge. This is the whitish discharge you get. And if you do hanging drop preparation, you can give flagella like this. 
that's how you can diagnose trichomonas vaginalis. But sometimes they get the bacterial vaginosis also. But bacterial vaginosis, you can get the frothy discharge, frothy, that you do not see in candida or a trichomonosis. And when you take a smear, you'll find usually the epithelial cells, they look like this, but they are uh, they are flooded with the bacteria and is a malodorous, foul smelling. That malodorous smell is diagnosed as bacterial vaginitis. I may take a smear, you'll they, these are called clue cells. You get a clue cell, they are loaded with the bacteria. That's how the bacterial vaginitis has been diagnosed. But the most common is candida albicans. So how do you treat candida albicans? Of course, before starting treatment, you have to find out whether there are any predisposing factors. Diabetes with the predisposing factors like a pregnancy, contraceptive bill, uh, pills, or, or endocrine disorders, compromised immunity can aggravate or can increase the frequency. And of course, it depends upon the control of glucose and, and the risk factors as mentioned above. So when it comes to the treatment, I mentioned the treatment drug of choice is the fluconazole. So in uncomplicated topical application of fluconazole, one between a single dose is enough, but this is a theoretical. According to us, I usually give one fluconazole daily, at least for nine days, then 300 milligram once in a week for three weeks. But when the disease becomes recurrent or the chronic, the fluconazole dose has to be 10 to 14 days. And according to this, uh, IDA say that American guideline 150 or weekly for six months, but we give 300 milligrams for six months, weekly 300. So this is how is a acute, you give 150 milligram for nine days, is a chronic minimum for two weeks, sometimes three weeks, and then 300 milligram once in a week for six months to prevent this recurrent. This is how we treat this. And you, you see this, another article, this article shows an antifungal for vulvovagina and candidiasis, acute or chronic drug of choice is fluconazole. Then similarly, they get balanoposthitis. When the patient of balanoposthitis, they come, they come with phimosis. Because there is the infection, there is the inflammation, you'll find a little bit discharge and there is a phimosis. Phimosis means they are not able to retract their prepuce or roll back. And that is because of there is the infection. So there is a candida infection. And this candida infection is usually is always secondary. So when the patient come with this, why is getting this candida infection? See, now diabetes has become common and one of the robust treatment for diabetes, HGLT2, that is DAPA glyphosine, DAPA glyphosine, which causes glycosuria. You must, have, you must be knowing in your practice that glycosuria can cause candida infection. And this is how they get, it has become very common. I see two or three patients, the patients with balanoposthitis, they are on anti-diabetic drug that is DAPA, gliflozone, that is AGL2. So you have to keep this in mind, otherwise you'll mistaken for other condition. Like now, this is another condition where you can see this phimosis. But this, this phimosis, again, there are the vertical cracks. These vertical cracks are very superficial and they are able to retract, but partially. While here, they are not able to retract. So this is usually seen in genital herpes. So these are the various presentations you can see. And if you see here, there is a chronic inflammation. There is a thickening in duration of the prepuce and the crack is there, but the crack is very deep. Deep crack indicates diabetic prepucitis, but this is due to disease diets and diabetes itself, not because of the medicine they are taking. Because medicine usually get the acute and this is get the chronic. This is how you have to differentiate from the drug-induced balanoposthitis, genital herpes, and 
this is what you get the typical diabetic candidiasis that micropapule, pustule micro. I show, showed you that satellite lesion, the similar lesions on the glands and the prepuce. This is a very typical diabetic balanopost diabetes. Again, drug of choice is fluconazole. Then coming to intertrigo. This, I remember this patient came to my clinic when I saw this red erythematous axilla. Involved, of course, there is involvement in both axillae. I asked him, are you diabetic? Patient say every month I get blood sugar done and I'm non-diabetic. My blood sugar is always normal. But I said, I would like to see other part because in diabetes, we know there is involvement of the oral cavity and genitalia. Oral cavity is oral cavity was free, but then see the prepuce and the glands, there's a lot of erythema. Then I said, we have to get your blood sugar done. The patient said, of course, I'll get it done, but I'm not diabetic. And for our surprise, his blood sugar was 400 milligram. So this is how the diabetic people, they come to our clinic. And many times the diabetes can be detected by skin manifestation. One of the differential diagnoses, what we, uh, what we call is the zoon balanitis. Maybe mistaken for diabetic balanitis, but June balanitis, if you see, there is a mirror image. There is the impression of the disease, the glands, the inflammation of the glands, and that impression is seen here. We call it the mirror image. That's how we differentiate from candidal balanitis. Sometimes you get what is called balanitis zerotica obliteras, VXO, but there you will get a deep pigmentation, which is not seen in candida. The next manifestation, what is called necrobiodicid lipodica, usually it comes on the lower extremity on the sheen, and you get a circular plaque with the active border and sclerosis. That's how we differentiate from the tinea. Usually, tinea, and nowadays you can see the big patches, but central is atrophy and the border is sclerosis. Of course, treatment is intralegional steroid or topical steroid. Then cellulitis. Cellulitis is very common in, uh, in diabetic patients and they come with the affection of the lower limb. Usually it can affect the upper limb also, but most of them is the lower limb. Their involvement of the deeper tissue, that is subkinetic tissue, caused by Staphylococcus aureus and beta hemolytic streptococci. So where we need broad spectrum antibiotics. See, this is how they come. When they come with the red erythema, edema, and swelling of the leg, usually is a unilateral, and always they complain fever with shivering. When they come with the fever or shivering, we always think of the malaria. We because that is the common. But I ask patient, patient, many times patient, they do not show you ask for it. They said there is a swelling. And if you do not start treatment, you'll get the what is called is a severe disease and there is a blister formation and more uh, the deeper involvement and still you do not treat, they get a necrosis. So these are the three stages of what we call is a cellulitis and the treatment is very simple. Treatment is antibiotic, broad spectrum antibiotic. Usually I am using linozolidine or you can use augmenting also but there is the pathology is the lymphatic edema. And to treat that lymphatic edema, you have to give short course of systemic steroid, at least start with 20 milligram two to three days, then switch over to 10 milligram. If it do not start edema, if we do not use steroid, edema is not going to settle down. And this is not given any book. This is my experience I'm sharing with you. It gives very good result under the cover of antibiotic. Then another manifestation, the reactive perforating dermatosis. Reactive perforating dermatosis usually see the patients where there is kidney or chronic renal failure or kidney is failing because of the diabetic patient. So they either come with this type of papule 
and you will see in the papule in the center there is a crust and this crust papule erythema with a crust is a diagnostic if the the patients are uncontrolled for longer time they get a hypertrophic lesions and in advanced stage of the renal disease with the diabetes they get very big lesions like this referred lesions so this is how you can diagnose curl disease of course the treatment is isotretinoid we have to give but the best treatment in advanced disease is renal tra uh, renal transfer yeah so only by changing the affected kidney will help them but when they come early the drug of choice is isotretinoin. Isotretinoin give to three to six months. Only antihistamine is not going to help. The organ transplant, the renal transplant is the only treatment for this type of curl disease. Another, they come with the bullous disease. Bulla. Usually when you see the bulla, this bulla are on the normal skin. There is no erythema. And there is no expiration because the very close differential diagnosis is bullous, bullous papigoid, where the bulla are all in the group, there are erythematous and they are scratchy or itchy. That's how we differentiate. Then xanthelasma. Xanthelasma, what we call xanthelasma tuberosum, xanthelasma palpebrum is a very common presentation. Uh, this alloy discoloration on the eyelids, around the eye is a very common presentation. Here you have to rule out blood sugar and the cardiac involvement. Always rule out a hypertension, blood sugar, and the cardiac involvement. Once you control diabetes, control the blood sugar, uh, control diabetes, control hypertension, and look for the dyslipidemia, cholesterol. And sometimes in the cholesterol is normal. There is a hypersensitivity to the hypersensitive receptor, the cholesterol. Control cholesterol, and then you can do surgery, and you can get a result like this. This patient we are following for the last five years. There is no recurrence. We have developed this treatment that there won't be recurrence. But many times, if we do only surgery, there will be recurrence is very common within six months. Then dermatophyting, fungal infection has become very common. If you see the prevalence is almost 40 to 80 percent. Why this is happening and why this presentation? I'll show this presentation. The patients are coming a atypical presentation, aggressive presentation, and intractable itching and pigmentation. See this patient, patient with the large plaques with the active lesions involving almost all back lesions on the foot, atypical side, lichen epication, very large lesions can be mistaken for eczema because of lichen epication. Sometimes they come such a big lesions with the, with the typical, for example, if you look at this, this design looks like our picture of our country, picture of India, you know. So concentric lesion, ring after ring, ring uh, over the ring, so these are the various presentations are seen. And somehow I was up to now involved in the research of HIV in the last 30 years. But then I realized there is a need to do research in TNA infection and started working four years back and found the treatment has to be minimum for two months. And the adherence, the compliance is the only solution we don't require any high drug, any costly drugs or costly investigation. And one of the best drugs I found is fluconazole 150 milligrams daily for six to eight weeks, where most of the patient can afford, while terbinafine, itraconazole got a lot of side effects, a lot of limitation, is very expensive. And that's why I say fluconazole is a drug of choice for masses, but daily doses for six to eight weeks. Paranoia. Paranoia is another. Many patients, they come with a paranoia involvement in the nails and, and the lateral posterior cuticle, lateral cuticle. Of course, this occurs in the patients who are working with the water, but it's very common with the diabetic patient, which are, they are involved in the uh, this vessel clinic, washing clothes, 
or working in, in, in the water. So these are the common manifestation. Sometimes they come with the, what is called acute. When they come with the acute, when it's a very painful like this, lot of erythema is a bacterial. But there is er the erythema or the swelling is less and there's hardly any pain is a candida. And the treatment of, of the candida, of course, is a fluconazole, but you have to give minimum for three to six months. Like this is candida intertrigo. And this is bacterial. Of course, bacteria, you give this antibiotic, but candida treatment has to be three to six months. And of course, the predisposing factor has to be addressed. Like the patient is cleaning vessels or washing clothes or working the water, you have to explain to it. This is the lady is working, is a fisherman. They, they work in the water all the time. So you have to explain to them. Just giving antibiotic, antifungal is are not enough. Then this is onychomycosis. Onychomycosis or tinea pedis is very common in diabetic patients. So this is the typical onychomycosis where the drug of choice again is propanosol, but you have to give one year totally. Again, this is tinea pedis. Here the drug of choice is propanosol, but you can give salicylic acid in tinea, fungal, not in candida. Candida you have to give like myconazole, clotamazole, or uh, eberconazole. Uh, you can give any, any whatever is available. But this is very important when they come with this inflammation. It is mistaken by many physicians, onychomycosis. But this is not onychomycosis, onico sorry, this is mistaken for cellulitis as a bacterial infection. But in diabetic patient, usually it is a fungal infection. And one of the important clue is you get WBC count, you'll find there is a neutropenia. Where is there is neutropenia and this type of inflammation, always think of deep mycosis. And usually this is caused by, uh, this is caused by fissurium organism or aspergillosis. And if you do not treat, they may go into ulceration, gangrene, osteomyelitis, and they may land up into amputations like this patient. So you have to diagnose early and start treating. Just thinking of bacterial is not enough. Most of the time in diabetic, it is a fungal infection. So combination therapy, the meaning of combination therapy, you can give fluconazole weekly with ketoconazole ointment. That's called the combination, not combination of two systemic drug. One systemic drug is enough, but you have to combine with topical application, like ketoconazole, clotrimazole, myconazole, eberconazole, laliconazole. You can use it. So, if this is in a diabetic patient. In diabetic patient, if you see, this is a fungal infection. Fungal infection, what is the hallmark? central clearance and active border. But here you get hardly any central clearance and you get active border, but they are not lined by papule and there is no central clear clearance because this patient is immunocompromised. Similar will ha happen in, in tinea cruris. You get a lichenifications and hardly you'll get central clearance. Similarly, other in, in diabetics, sometimes you just get diffuse superficial scaling. You do not get that typical fungal infection. Then in HIV, we see this a lot of patients with the HIV again diffuse. This is happening in because of compromised immunity. Methotrexate, the patient is taking methotrex now in the rom uh, in a rheumatic practice, they're using a lot of methotrexate. Patients are taking for three years, four years, where the immunity gets suppressed and they get this type of lesion in fungus, but they won't get a typical for this. Even the patients have immunosuppressive drug like cyclosporine, where you suspect, where you are taking the scraping and you can demonstrate what is called this hypi. This hypi are diagnostic of fungal infection. So there's called by deep infection that I was talking about many times, diagnosed cellulitis is a fusarium or aspergillosis.
same thing. See, these are the fungal infection. Now we are seeing very extensive, even in non-diabetic patients. See, this is how we treat this same patient. This is the we treat, and this is we treat only with the fluconazole. By what I want to give the message is by good adherence, good compliance. We don't need any high or costly drugs. See. See, and what we call is the counseling. Explain to the patient they require six weeks to three months. Depends upon the ex extensive tenure. They do not apply soap in that area. All family members should be treated at the same time. Your clothes should be washed in the hot water and ironed properly. And avoid steroid. Don't use steroid. The, this is the counseling. If you do it, ask patient to take regularly the patients, they won't get any relapse or recurrence. Antifungal therapy, we mentioned that you can give, yeah. So antifungal therapy, there are many drugs I mentioned, terbinafine, grisoforvin, itracon, fluconazole. They are effective, but according to me, most of the patient, they can afford fluconazole. If you want to control the disease, you want to control the epidemic, you got to use fluconazole. This is our research. It is not given anywhere in the book. Uh, uh, I have started using fluconazole 115 a daily for six to eight weeks. It is not given in any book. But then many, many, many my colleague dermatologists they started asking why you are giving. I said I have studied and found this is a safe drug, effective drug. As a HIV clinician, we have used. Fluconazole 400 milligram daily given for one year in cryptococcal meningitis and there is hardly any side effects. So it's a very safe drug. So if you want to treat for the masses, the people who can't afford, the fluconazole is the drug of choice. Of course, there are many criteria, but now there is hardly any time because it's an effective drug, it's an affordable drug, and it is safe. So I thought I'll share this. There was not a single clinical study, but we conducted clinical study. And I must thank FDC. They came forward. They can, they supported the study, and we found fluconazole is very safe and is very effective, and is got hardly any side effect. Because so fluconazole in tinea option for masses, but daily doses. I think there are cases where the time limit is there, so I'm not going through. Uh, uh, so Cushing syndrome, Cushing syndrome, we know that what happened, the patient, they come with the atrophy or the stri. They get two types of stri. Red, that is called stri rubra. These are the early and the late. They get stri uh, usually without any redness, without any inflammation. So that is the chronic. So these two types of they get overweight, what is called metabolic syndrome, and people, people are obese, they get fungal infection, they get stretch mark, what is called the stretch mark. And this is the one of the important clinical, this is one of the important clinical presentation. Then about thyroid. In thyroid, what they get, common manifestation skin is myxedema. Myxedema usually get involvement of the lower leg sheen, where you'll find the edema and shiny papule, waxy papule with the what is called or the orange appearance or the edema with the orange peel like orange. So these are the common manifestation we see in diabetes and in a myxedema or the hypothyroidism and Cushing syndrome. I think now I'll stop sharing my slides. Are there any questions? I'll take it. Yeah. And thank you very much for attending and patient listening to my talk. Thank you. Sriyan? Yes, sir, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, thank you for, for this wonderful session, sir. The presentation was really nice. And, sir, we do have some questions from our audience if you'd like to take that up. Uh, so, sir, the first question from our audience is, how can skin changes such as vertigo in patient with thyroid disease 
serve as a marker for other autoimmune condition? Yeah, usually in autoimmune conditions, you get the same means edema, inflammation, but it is generalized in autoimmune. While this is localized, that is number one. Secondly, you can get the atrophy there. In autoimmune disease, you get atrophy. You do not get atrophy. Thirdly, some of the autoimmune disease, you can get follicular plugging. You get the depigmentation. There are many changes in autoimmune disease. And autoimmune disease, usually find it is associated with the other, of course, the joint pain will be there. In, or the patient will lose in weight. Patient will have fever. Patient will have articular. So many other things are there. While the myxedema, also the, the hypothyroidism, we know that patient becomes sluggish, they become slow. So many other signs are there. So you have to look for associated signs, associated findings that will differentiate. But I'm very happy. This is a very good question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the common skin findings in autoimmune thyroid disease like Hashimoto thyroiditis and grave disease and how do they in, uh, inform disease management? Yeah, see Hashimoto thyroiditis is called thyroid autoimmune where one of the common manifestation is urticaria. This urticaria has become a big problem, chronic urticaria. But many times we have found it is caused by, that's why any patient of chronic urticaria comes to your clinic you have to rule out thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroid. That's a very, that's a very common presentation of autoimmune disease. Yeah. So there is one last question. Yeah. What interventions can be recommended to manage or prevent skin-related complications such as steria and easy uh, bruising in crushing syndrome? Yeah. Uh, 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 can you repeat the question to prevent? To prevent skin-related complications such as steria and easy uh, bruising in crushing yeah. syndrome. Okay, yeah, that's okay. See, ultimately everything is a metabolism. Our metabolism becomes slow, metabolism becomes disturbed. What is called is a Ross syndrome, where there is an antioxidant, uh, there's a, a oxidation Ross, what you call. There is a toxicity, so vitality of each and every tissue goes down. The regeneration suffers, and the cells they do not work up to their up to their marks. So everything becomes slow. So the first thing any patient comes to a clinic, not only for the Cushing syndrome or the any chronic disease, the first indication in our clinic is. Exercise, physical activities. Physical activity is very important. We ask people about the physical activity at least one hour. That is very important. We encourage them to get involved in one of the game more than just going to the gym. Of course, they can do whatever they want, but we encourage them open ground activities like cycling, swimming, playing badminton, table tennis, like that, you know, where you get entertainment plus exercise. Second is the food, food habit. Eat at the proper time. Of course, now many people are aware eating two times in a day is a very important and that is now generalized. I remember my practice, two gentlemen, very rich people in Bombay, both of them staying at Malbar Hill. Malbar Hill is known for the rich, only rich people can afford. 86-year-old people, they used to come to my clinic, they used to come by bus. And I used to ask them, you can afford anything and you are 86, still you are coming by the bus, how you manage? And both of them told me, doctor, we take food at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock, no eating in between. This is a story I'm talking. This patient has to see 30 years before. So this was well known in India, uh, in our India. Eat two times, but the lifestyle has changed everything. What we call progression or civilization, I, I do not know. But this lifestyle, we have to change it. 
So second is the diet. Third is they have to see that they take proper diet. It's the proteins because we take more carbohydrate, green vegetables, minerals, and vitamins. There has to be good balanced diet. And these are the things. And of course, you have to treat the disease, underlying cause. But these are the general instructions are very important for each and every chronic disease, whether it's the diabetes, whether it's the cancer, whether it's the psoriasis, or anything. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all our questions. That's all from our audience, sir. So before concluding, sir, any take-home message from your end? See, my message is now diabetes is a chronic disease and is so common. All of us, we should work to prevent diabetes because prevention is the only solution. We can reduce our burden, our nation's burden. Uh, of course, our quality of life, we can live better life. So we have to reduce. So any patient comes to your clinic, I'll suggest every doctor ask the family history of diabetes. And if there is a family history, see that they will do proper exercise, they take proper food and problem, and they can change their lifestyle and prevent their diabetes, hypertension, and chronic diseases. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. With your permission, I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you. Okay, Sriyan, thank you. And thank you, everybody, including your technical person. And we'll meet some other time. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah.